Okay, welcome once again to the last fall Ready, Set, Teach event on remote teaching. My name is Lisa Felipe and I am the Director of Excellence in Pedagogy and Innovative Classrooms or EPIC as we are known on campus. This is the third year uh, that we've kicked off the year with Ready, Set, Teach. And uh, this year, RST became part of the Fall Teaching Forum, which is, was a collaboration between EPIC CAT and SEALs. Um, and it, it was a set of events uh, uh, and workshops that we've been doing for the last uh, couple of weeks. And hopefully some of you were able to attend some of those workshops. Um, our goal today with our panelists is to talk about the quick transition uh, from last spring um, to remote classes and, ex and uh, their experiences of, of uh, uh, as instructors, TAs, and undergraduate students. Uh, but before I introduce our panelists, whom you see on your screen right now, I'd like to first thank you all for spending this very busy time with us. And we hope that you're able to get some insights and some inspiration as we continue to work apart from each other. To officially start us off, please join me in welcoming Dean David Skaberg, Senior Dean of the college, Dean of Humanities and Professor from the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures. David, welcome and please uh, take, it, take it away. Thanks, Lisa. Um, yeah, I would like to welcome everyone who's participating today. If you've been paying attention to the EPIC program since it was uh, funded by Mellon several years back, uh, you will have noticed that we've systematically built in opportunities for instructors, professors and lecturers and others to speak with students, graduate students and undergraduates. We've really foregrounded the interaction around teaching. It's not a single direction um, sort of interaction. It, it goes both ways. And we strongly believe that we faculty can improve our teaching by listening more to the experiences of humanities, graduate students and undergraduates in our classrooms. Of course, since we all shifted to uh, online well, remote teaching, uh, in March, we have been entirely dependent on this medium uh, to project to each other and to share with each other the sorts of things we usually do in classrooms. And what I mean by that is the, the, the construction of learning communities in classrooms that actually allow people to, to come into the center, to find their voices, to interact both in the classroom setting and very confidently through writing and so forth. We face some real challenges there. I would say proudly that, that UCLA has risen to this challenge in a lot of ways. We have you and many people who are not on this call to thank for that, but the challenge goes on. And in, in, in certain ways, the stakes are even higher this quarter. I taught in spring, I'm teaching again in fall. Um, now we really need to start to learn how to do this right, or at least that's how I take my, my mission. How am I going to do my remote teaching of a regular undergraduate seminar this quarter in a way that actually delivers to the students as much as I can possibly de deliver and as much as they can get from other students. And I think the right place to ask that question is to a panel of this sort, where we see the perspectives of many people involved in different places in a course. And we can start to think about how to teach in the humanities remotely in a way that's still going to affect our students' lives as deep, deeply and positively as possible. So thank you for being here um, and I look forward to the panel. Thank you so much, David. Um, at this point, the, the Q&A feature, you should be able to see it on your screen on the very bottom, uh, is now open. And at any point during our conversation, you find yourself with a question, please feel free to type them up. Uh, later on, um, Alejandra Campoy will be helping us um, ask uh, these questions to the panelists and she will also be monitoring uh, the Q&A for us. Um, also, if you have particular questions that are not related to the questions you wanna ask the panelists, whether it's um, about the technology or you know anything in general, the chat is also open and Anle, our um, graduate student researcher um, is also monitoring the chat. So please free to ask your questions um, about you know, tech or about any kind of uh, questions you have about the webinar itself uh, in, on the chat. Okay, so now to our panelists. We are joined today by Talia Isayan, 
from the class of 2020. She was an English major uh, as an undergraduate student, and uh, she just graduated from UCLA this past spring with a major uh, in English. Hi, Talia, wave your hand so people can see who you are. Hey, Talia. Okay, next is Claire Chua, another member of the class of 2020 who graduated from UCLA with a psychology degree. She continues her work here on campus uh, by pursuing a master's uh, degree in social science uh, and she's beginning this fall. Congratulations, Claire, and please wave your hand. Great. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Amy Carroll. Amy is a PhD student uh, with the Near Eastern Languages and Cultures. Amy, thank you for joining us today. I like your background, <laughs> it's awesome. Um, next, we have Jordan Galsinski. Um, she's also a PhD student from Near Eastern Languages and Cultures. Hi, Jordan, thank you. Um, Next on the line, we have Professor Kara Cooney, who is a professor of Egyptian art and architecture, as well as the chair of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures. Thank you for joining us today, Kara. Um, this past spring, Kara taught a large lecture course, uh, The Ancient Near East, M130 on Ancient Egyptian uh, Religion. Both Amy and Jordan TA'd for the course, and Talia and Claire were students uh, from the course, um, and they had Jordan as their uh, TA. And so we invited them here today to, for us to get a sense of what it was like to teach a large lecture course, um, a TA section, and also to hear from the perspective of a student um, in the course as well. Finally, last but not least, is uh, David McFadden, Professor of Comparative Literature and Musicology, as well as um, the EPIC um, EPIC faculty co-director along with uh, Gyala Mahajan. He's joining us today to also provide another perspective on remote teaching and learning um, and also hopefully um, talking to us about how to engage with students in this, in this medium. Thank you all for joining us. So let's begin. Um, I'm gonna begin uh, with just kind of going around um, and, and asking you to speak about some of the challenges. We'll start with the challenges first, then we'll go you know, with the good stuff <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a second. But some of the challenges that you encountered in your NELC course or in you know, other areas of teaching for the TAs and the, our faculty members and your experience as a student, um, Talia and Claire, this past spring um, and, and how that quick transition felt for you as either an instructor or a student. And um, anyone can start, anyone who's ready can start. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and start since it was my class. <laughs> I'll start. Um, Thanks, the, Sarah. There, no worries. Um, there can't have been any more of a quick transition for me than this class because I didn't even expect to be teaching it. Uh, a colleague of mine had a had a, a different class that she has suddenly had to be teaching, and I thought, oh my God, we already have students signed up, so we'll keep it. And so I inherited a class that I hadn't taught in, oh my God, 12 years, and, and it coincided with a book project that I was working on. And since the class was Egyptian religion, I decided to conflate the the book project in the class and I took my, and I told the class that I was doing this, I took my book proposal and I put it into a syllabus format. And then I just started furiously creating PowerPoints as quickly as I could. And the class came together with um, what we thought would be a hundred students for the two TAs, Jordan and Amy. But then we had two Fulbrights that weren't granted because everything was falling apart. And so two, two additional grad students came on. I'm like, well, let's put them in this class and see what happens. Filled up in two seconds. 200 people class that I've never taught before with PowerPoints that I'm teaching blind. And we just, you know, if it weren't for Jordan and Amy to help me sort everything out, organize it, this was very much a team effort. We couldn't have, have pulled all of this together. And the way that we did it, and I'll let Jordan and Amy jump in um, in just a second, is, you know, we, we thought, we talked a lot, we had Zooms amongst ourselves, how do you think we should do this? And we decided to do it asynchronously, given how many students were abroad, for the lectures. However, because so many people were having 
moments of anxious panic or fe feeling cut off from society, needing some sort of an outlet to talk about what is ideology? How does it link to politics, which became the, the cohesion of the course? We then added on a Thursday morning, one hour of, of chat amongst those who could make it. It was optional. We offered extra credit, but we would get like 100, 150 students in that, in that chat section. And people were, because it was about religious ideology and political manipulation thereof, there was a lot to talk about. And because the class was about making the ancient world relevant, there were many connections back and forth. And I tried to be as open about those connections as we possibly could. So that when there was a moment of rioting or a moment of marching or a moment of debating, um, that we, we were bringing all of that into the discussion. And um, I taught it in this room. And uh, there were moments, as, as Jordan and Amy know, when I finished a lecture, I'm like, well, that was horrible. That was horrible. And they both said, no, it was fine. Don't worry. And then, and we, you know, I tried to just pull it together, but it is a strange thing to yell to yourself alone in a room and to have just the PowerPoint up and not be able to see the students and have any interaction. And for those professors like myself who are used to a call and response, you know, what do you guys think? And then you get some feedback from the students and then you're able to work with it. You get none of that. And you have to just imagine in your head what a call and response would be. And I work with an iPad, so I would just stare at the little pinpoint camera on my iPad trying to connect in whatever ways that I could, but this was uh, very much a trial by fire, and, uh, and I'm glad that we were able to, to make it work out as well as we could. But now um, I'll let um, Amy and Jordan jump in and then our, our students. I mean, I'll jump in and concur with the kind of... Um adjusting to teaching to a screen and how you realize how much you actually rely upon body language and like locking eyes with people and people nodding as you're teaching. Um, we did live discussion sections for the class, um, which I think was good balance of asynchronous and live events. And yeah, for me, it was just getting used to kind of just talking to myself. Um, I mean, luckily I had good students who, you know, interacted and, were present and kept their cameras on and everything like that. So that was great. Um, but it's still definitely something to adjust to uh, just even amongst our grad classes, even just the changing kind of trying not to talk over each other because there's a lag between the Zoom screens and things like this. Um, and I think also we were all on the same page with like being very flexible and uh, empathetic to, you know, everyone's situation that like a very strange time we were in. A lot of things were happening all at once. And I think overall we were just erring on the side of, you know, being flexible, being empathetic and understanding situations. And um, I think that worked out for the best. Yeah. But this was uh, a to second guess whether somebody's uh, no. situation was true or not. Yeah. We just went with it. And if there were, if people needed uh, another week, if they needed something in addition, we just, okay. We're, and that we went in with that spirit. And I think that was very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the students yeah. appreciated it, at least from the feedback I got. Yeah. So, and even like making, we made the final project um, optional. And because that was when all the protests were happening and it was just a very stressful trying time for a lot of people. So you know, the final project became optional, so you could raise your grade if you wanted to, or if you were happy with your grade, then you didn't have to worry about it. And um, I think being flexible like that and allowing kind of different situations uh, to happen, I think, allowed, made the class better. Yeah. Amy? Excuse me, and I'll agree with that. I'll agree with that. The, the hardest part, because working with, with Kara and with Jordan was great because, yeah, we were all pretty much on the same page and we all kind of got, you know, did did our, our thing. Like um, Jordan helped, did a lot with the, the TA content. I happened to do tech stuff. So I was a lot of the times like the Zoom master and recording mm -hmm. the lectures and putting them up on CCLE. Um, Kara was obviously the one teaching and doing all <laughs> the actual hard work. Um, and so, so like we were able to make basically a well-oiled machine pretty quickly, which was was great. Um, and really the, the hardest part, as both of them had already said, was really the, the teaching to the void, sort of, is kind of what it feels like sometimes, where you're just, yeah, talking to yourself in your room and hoping someone's listening. 
Um, also had really great students who were were engaged and who would have their cameras on and all that. But even then, it's still a little there's their little faces in the corner and you can't see all of them and it's really hard to actually connect with them and that's been that's been the biggest challenge of this even um, over the summer when I taught again and it's just it's the part I like the least but it's I mean it's an artifact of what we have to do right just make the best of it but yeah right. but do you know what before we go to the students do you know what the percentage was of the final project that was completed was it less than half do you do you know how many way less than half way less way than less. half because I, I had the other I had a couple maybe yeah and it was, it like was three students or four. who like already had like a hundred and they were just like doing it um but I think because we the way we structured the project in general that it was like half was due midway and then the other half was due at the end we could check in with people and make sure they were you know on the right track and catch anything um, so everyone was in a, I think, a really good place overall. And then we have final presentations at the end, which I actually liked, like little short, like two, three minute, tell me about your project, show us what object you worked on. They had to use a Pharaoh. And we used ThingLink, which I actually learned from one of the Epic courses that I took the prior quarter. So, and, you know, just your experiences, how did you make the class more useful to yourselves? How then Jordan would give like feedback. Um, and I think like what Jordan said about the projects, that was really great. And just having the opportunity to look at other people, because I still got to do a peer review. I still got to do my presentation in the form of a So I felt like I was very much present in the class. Um, and I consider myself like a very type A person where I like to be on top of every kind of playing by here. Um, it was a really disorienting and alienating experience. Um, and I really like the way that Professor Cooney um, structured the class because, again, like I am a person that like really likes to focus on the little details. And it was really where like now everything has to be submitted online. Um, it was really hard, but Professor Cooney... When you're teaching during a crisis, it clarifies what is applicable, what is important, and what is not. And the, the names and dates of a bunch of kings long past, thousands of years past, suddenly become much less applicable than all of the things swirling around us. If there's an elephant in the room as the instructor, even if you're alone in a room in a pandemic, it should be discussed. And so all of those things were, were brought in as much as possible and keeping the class relevant. It also, I, I have to also point out for those instructors who are watching this that my book project, it, it did end up being a successful experiment for my book project because I also simultaneously sent off the recorded lectures for um, uh, transcription. I received those transcriptions, a mess to be sure, but then I put those into, I took those notes kind of as bullet points and rewrote a, a trade book using that material and those thoughts because when you're speaking alone in a room and you're kind of just musing about what's happening in the world, it, it is kind of a freeing experience in that I think I may have said more provocative things alone in my office than I might have in a classroom. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. So I, I was able to push the envelope in my own mind and, and I did end up getting a, a, a book manuscript out of this in the end, which I'm still working on, of course, and this will take some time. But um, it was strange to see how writing and teaching and all of these things could indeed come together on the fly last minute, um, trying at the same time to be as flexible with students as possible. It's a crazy experience to try to teach when nobody knows where the goalposts are, what the rules of the game are, when anything's going to start and stop, and we just had to, had to work with things as we could. The last, the last week, I thought, oh, well, we won't have classes because everyone's protesting, but things had blown up so much that we needed to talk about things. And I ended up doing a lecture specifically about how ideology is manipulated by political figures and how we can understand this and what we can do going forward and to ideas of crisis and collapse within societies ancient and modern. And the discussion that week was very provocative and, and helpful as well. And I know from the student evaluations that the, for those students that were, who were able to attend, it was very meaningful to have some kind of outreach to the world in which you could analyze and discuss all of the crazy that was happening around you. So 
Um, it doesn't matter if these things happened 3,000 years ago. Everything is relevant. Everything is applicable. And it was, it was interesting to be able to make that work. But that's the gift of the humanities. And I'm not a chemistry instructor. So, so Claire and Talia, what was the most useful that, like, what kept you engaged the most? Did you like the discussion? If, I know, Claire, you couldn't participate, but Talia, you did. But did, Claire, did you watch them recorded or did you just, how did you guys, what was the most engaging? Was it the reading? Was it the lectures? How did it work? I definitely appreciated the Thursday live, like, discussions that we had with the entire class. I, again, it was my first time taking an online class and it was definitely my first time experiencing a class format of that way. So it was like a little hard to get used to in the beginning. Um, but like by the end of week two, week three, I was like, oh, I, I was looking forward to our Thursday discussions um, because it was a very free flowing format. Like we would just go where the conversation went naturally. Um, and I originally thought it was going to be kind of boring where like people would say like, oh, what date did you mention? Or what was this Pharaoh's name? Um, but I thought the conversations were really engaging because it wasn't just back and forth like Q&A. There was a discussion happening between you and I and the TAs. Um, and everyone in the class. And it was really interesting because people would, you know, cite uh, lectures or they would talk about readings. Um, and there were some weeks where like I did fall behind readings um, like any other student, um, but it was really engaging to see like other people talk about their experiences uh, approaching a reading and say like, and talk about ideas that like, hey, I hadn't thought about it that way or I hadn't really connected that reading to this idea. But now that, you know, someone's asked this question, I totally see it. Um, and again, like having that experience with like 150 people, um, I thought it would be like a little disorganized, but it actually worked out really well because again, 150 people are coming together and asking different questions and coming up with different things um, and different interpretations of what we are working with. Yeah. Those discussions, yeah. oh Claire, one thing really fast, and this is for instructors, when you're having those live discussions, it's hard to be organic and you have to wait for these long, awkward pauses you know, you know that moment in the classroom when you're like, so what do you guys think? And nobody answers because it's the second day or first day and it's this long pregnant pause. It's even worse on Zoom. And so, but you still have to let it happen and just take a moment. And I would have like a little side discussion with Jordan and Amy and then we would wait and then people might type a question. And so you just have to let those moments work themselves out, encourage students to type as well as to say something. Um, and then the discussions happen. Sorry, Claire, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I wanted to say I appreciate it because even though like the time difference and everything, I didn't attend the sessions live, they were recorded. And so it was helpful for me to kind of first watch the recorded lectures and then watch the live. And it was just so interesting to me that like, I like exactly what Tyler said, like the things that other people would think of, the links that they made, because I feel like that's such a valuable thing. And it's honestly even better than like a in-person lecture because you wouldn't be able to hear so, so many people share in that setting. But over Zoom, it was like wonderful. So, yeah, and you know, for graduate seminars, it makes sense that in some ways it's an asset to work over Zoom because you can include more voices, people from abroad. Can we work in Egypt and the Levant to connect with those voices in real time is amazing. This was not that class, but I think that because it was Zoom and online, there were still opportunities for those students who were perhaps shyer, who may not have spoken up in class to speak up and at, from the instructor's point of view, we all know when you, that each class has a kind of attitude to it and that there are probably five students, even a big 200 class that can dominate the conversation. And once those five students have created their territory in a classroom, other people pull back. The Zoom environment did not allow that kind of domination. And I appreciated that because there were voices coming from all different students. I would say dozens and dozens of students in this 200 person class were able to participate, which was pretty amazing. And I mm -hmm. think um, helped me to see the benefits of this kind of teaching rather than not. Um, something I'd be interested to know about the NELP class is whether or not, because already we're at the start of a new school year, was, were you able to see from the evaluations what the general perception of the course was among undergraduates? Do you have a general sense um, of how they uh, either prefer or, or dislike this uh, form of instruction? Because in my own classes, the, the benefits you can imagine are fairly, fairly self-explanatory, 
but uh, one of the, 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 the two, two things they thought were least successful. One <clears throat> was that working from home in any form makes it harder to be um, motivated. And in a related manner, um, they didn't really feel that faculty were making use of some of the basic functionality within Zoom. And I wondered if either those issues or related problems had led you to a general perception of whether undergrads like or dislike what we've recently gone through. I'll, I'll leave it to Amy and Jordan to discuss um, some of the details of student outreach, but let me just tell you the basic functionality of Zoom on my iPad was what I could make it and I relied oh, yeah. on <laughs> without, without the days, and if I were running this on my own and they know this about me, I'm not super techie, and it would have been a very different class if I hadn't had them helping me and teaching me. Like, like I didn't even know at the beginning, we had to figure out how to run the PowerPoints, and I, I couldn't get it to work, and much cursing in this office as we were trying to do that. And um, some, you know, the PowerPoints would only share partial slides and weird things were happening in the cyberspace world. And if I didn't, if you're teaching alone and you don't have support because it's not a big class and you don't have TAs, that's when I think things really can go sideways and everyone feels isolated. And um, you have to remember that places like Hum Tech have drop-in hours and, and you have to try to find the resources as you can. But um, yeah, as for the, and let me get to your other question about student evaluations. It was funny. I, I've, I haven't read them very thoroughly, but I worked, I looked through them and I'm like, oh, look at that. They're treating this like a normal class, complaining that I'm not organized and complaining that the class seemed to be done on the fly. I'm like, indeed it was. And that it wasn't Egyptian religion as they expected. And no, it was not. It was about divine kingship and the ideology of rule. And um and there were a few of those type A people that wanted things to run in a more regimented, uh, practiced way. And that was not this class. This class was, you know, we were all moving on the fly and trying to come up with things quickly. Um, so I take those, those criticisms with, um, with all the, the, there was a lot of worth to those criticisms. But um, a lot of students were saying things like, you know, this was a touchstone for me and helped me to analyze all of the crazy things that were happening around me. And it was, it was helpful to see politics through a lens thousands of years removed so that you can actually identify things with more clarity than not. But, um, but Jordan and Amy, you guys can, can tell me what you guys think was successful. And, and criticize at will. I always encourage the students to criticize me like they would criticize a textbook. Um, and so that's, that's helpful in the discussions and, and everything as well. I mean, for me yeah. personally, my um, my reviews were like one of the best reviews I've gotten. Um, mm -hmm. Students seemed really happy with discussion section and uh, how flexible we were overall and how like, I guess, helpful we were trying to be. Like I think of one time when, um, you know, the, they don't have access to a library and we're trying to do research about Egyptian pharaohs and kings and stuff. And they were having trouble finding sources and Amy had the good idea to like let's just make a box folder of all the kings that the students are doing and we'll just go from our PDFs because we have a big PDF library and we'll just throw sources into it so at least they have something to work with um, and between Amy and I both like we filled out the box folder very quickly it didn't take that much time because it was already we already had PDF libraries to pull from and then it just gave the students kind of a starting place with research and sources um, since you know, the online resources were weird at that point. Not everything was available online and stuff. Um, I personally really liked the kind of asynchronous live back and forth um, that we taped the lectures and then had a kind of like a live discussion. I thought that was really useful and helpful. And I think it's the best of what uh, at home learning can be because you can watch the lectures whenever you want, you can rewatch them. Um, at your own discretion, but then you get the, also the one-on-one -on -one with the TA and with the professor at both times. So I like that divide up of time. Amy. Yeah, and same thing. Like, I had wonderful reviews. The only criticism they had was a number of students were like, I hate Zoom. I'm like, yo, me too. Like, <laughs> sure. I, I wish we had a different... <laughs> 
I wish I could meet you in person, but sure. Uh, so like that was really the only the only criticism I got about the class was I wish it wasn't Zoom. Um, but other than that, yeah, it, it tended, they liked the format of it. They liked having the synchronous, asynchronous and the option to be completely asynchronous because like Jordan, I had students who weren't here in the United States. I had students who were, you know, hours apart. And um, I also would try to like, I had a, I would try and hook them up together in some of these instances as well. So like they could have discussions between themselves. Um, and I had a discussion board on, on that I put on CCLE. Um, so they could talk amongst themselves during times where they were able to talk. And they also liked being able to do that as well. So that way um, it wasn't just watching in the void or something like that. And also I would, I uh, adjusted my office hours. I had like 9 p.m. office hours a few times to make sure that they could, they could talk to me um, at times that both of us were not sleeping. Uh, so that's, that was the main criticism problem uh, that I had, but the rest of it, they really liked it. I think too, Amy, I don't know about oh, you sorry, in office hours. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but I found like taking the first like five minutes of office hours with the student just to like check in on them and be like, how are you? Yes. And what's up with your life? And not like get right down to business immediately, but to just, you know, maybe you're not seeing that many other humans and just to, like give a little human interaction. Um, I appreciate mm -hmm. it. And I think and I got to know like Talia a lot better. We talked about the end of school and what she was planning to do afterwards and all this kind of stuff. So I think um, have like, yeah, forming relationships and like relying upon that a lot more too helps. There was even a moment in which some of the students weren't responding, weren't posting their papers, weren't doing assignments. I think there were four of them. And we made a concerted effort during the time of crisis to hunt them down <laughs> to find out what had gone on. And I then ended up writing, and I wouldn't have done this in a normal class, but I wrote specifically saying, are you okay? What is going on? And why are you not, why is it, are you ghosting us? There, it's a complete lights out, what's going on? And for every case, I got a response. Um, three of them were going through really difficult times involving health, family members or other problems. And it was good that we had reached out and one was just like, I can't handle it, I'm, I'm dropping, okay, fine. But it was, it was an interesting, um, it, it encouraged us to take a little more care of, of our students. And for me to just continually check in with the TAs and ask, what's the feedback? Because, you know, I think I assigned too much reading. In fact, I know I did from the student evaluations, but what professor doesn't? And then working with, with Jordan, Amy, and our other two uh, TAs to say, okay, this one's optional. And just work with that on the fly because the, you know, if, if I'm excited about the class and I'm putting in all of this reading, okay, fine, let's, let's decide some things are optional and some things aren't and make things about the interest levels of the, the students. And David, I think you had something. No, I was just gonna say, it's probably time that we see what the audience has. So Alejandra, would you like to reveal some of the questions? I mean, this sounds very, very the price is right, but Alejandra, would you like to reveal some of the questions that the audience has? Um, yes, so I'm sure, I think everyone can see the questions, but um, I'm going ahead and, and mark the ones that we um, could answer live. Um, so the first one uh, I think will be a quick question, so I think we could go ahead and cover that one first, which is what was the link program you mentioned? And I believe that was for Jordan, who we were talking about. Um, it's called ThingLink, and it's a annotation software. Um, it's free to use. And you can either upload 3D models or images or movies or videos and add annotations. So um, the project, the large project we had the students do was to pick up King and then pick objects related to his reign that displayed his use of ideology, ideological power. And they had to annotate the images to show, you know, the typical museum label type of background, but then also, you know, description of the object, how it relates to their thesis or their theme for the whole project overall and a discussion. Claire did a really cool like walking through Hormahev's tomb and had the annotations pop up as you walked through the tomb. So it was a little bit more creative um, for the students, allowed them to um, be as creative as they wanted. They could also just, you know, if they wanted to do basic photo and, and writing that was available too. But I, we used it in one of the epic classes and I thought it was really cool. And since we were transitioning Jordan. online, we were like, hey, let's give this a shot. 
Jordan, can you put the link into the chat? Sure. Okay. Yes. Um, they, I don't know if you can see they um, did write it under the question, but yeah, also share it in the chat. Share okay. it in the chat. Yeah. Um, yeah, because we're getting a couple of questions about that. Um, the next question um, I think we can cover is, um, how did you handle the Thursday Q&A live? Were undergrads willing to voice questions and how did you keep track? I didn't keep track. I, I kept my eye on the little camera and I relied on, on Amy to keep things recording and working. She was our tech and then I relied on Jordan to to be the the moderator for questions and so she could keep her eye on the questions and on the time and also cut things off and say okay we only have two or three more questions um and we never ran out of questions i guess when you're waiting for people to type questions or to want to say anything um that was the moment for the tas to jump in and say we've got this question in section this has come up multiple times and so we kind of had an intro plan for the first like 10 minutes to, to get the students interactive and, and wanting to ask questions. So we would generally start with something like that and then, and then move on. Um, but I if you're running a class alone, if you're doing a big upper div class, um, you've got 100, 150 students, um, it's, it's not a bad idea to, to have somebody in there to help moderate. And I'm not sure exactly how to do that if you don't have a TA. Who can, who can help you with that moderation. Because one of the reasons this class worked so well is because I had so much help. And if I was doing this on my own, there would have been many moments where I collapsed in a puddle of tears. Um, so that's, that's a huge thing. And I know there are many people watching this saying, well, this is a lot of help this does without TAs. Um, and that's where you have to, I think, assemble a team in a sense. And I, I can imagine that working within a department or cross-departmentally, um, lecturers and professors can can potentially help each other to, to run some of these Zoom sessions that are so taxing where you don't have the attention, all the attention you need to look at the participants bar, look at what people are chatting, keep your attention focused on what the question is. You can't, who can multitask like that? So it, I think it might be helpful for, pe for people to create the village that they need if they're, if they're working Zooms like this. I can't imagine how else I would have done it. Um. Oh, I was just going to say, it, um, I know humanities technology will help with some of the Zoom troubleshooting. If any of you guys are having troubles with that, the uh, research and instructional technology consultants there are great. Um, I know that because I used to be one of them, which was helpful when, <laughs> when we did this transition. Um, and so if you reach out to them, they'll definitely help with the Zoom portion of it. Um, the other thing that I would do is, because in discussion section, we also took attendance um, and if like obviously if the students weren't in class they had alternatives to get those attendance points those participation points so it wasn't just attendance but I just took screenshots of the participants list so I didn't even have to to think about it much later and it was super easy that way and I then, did the same then thing I put it in yeah, yeah I just took just screenshots easier. and I mean I know you can go into zoom and look at the meeting and pull the attendance list and stuff but I just would mute myself and take a screenshot and then it was yep. pretty easy that way. <laughs> for, recording it, the it class, oh, uh, for recording the class, I recorded it in one go because mm -hmm. I felt like it was just easier for me. I can imagine that somebody needs a break and can't talk for two hours in, in one, at one time. We also tried to keep the lecture to, there were, this is another complaint. Students said the lectures were too long, um, yeah. which is great. It's a fine complaint. Uh, and I, my lectures were, I would do like two 50 minute lectures a week and I think some of the more type A students were saying this is beyond the time that we're supposed to spend in class with two 50-minute lectures plus the hour of discussion and it's too much and so when when those um, complaints were made I tried to cut back on on uh, lecture time but I, it's hard for me to cut back on Ramsey's the second when you're talking about political <laughs> ideology so I fail and um, and you know we just tried to do workarounds as best um, as best we could. But then Amy would cut the lecture in half where she felt it was an yeah. appropriate spot. Put one in week one and or one one in the first part of the week, one in the second part of the week on the CCLE to give the students an idea that they didn't have to watch it in one whole block. But it was posted. I think Monday afternoon, Tuesday morning, mm -hmm. we posted the lectures, yeah. and then they could work on the reading and other things. So everything was there at the beginning of the week. Yeah, we'd meet Monday mornings, like yep. 8 a.m. for the lectures, and 
and go. Yeah. And I was always behind on my PowerPoint. So there were days where I was like, you guys, I need another hour. And we would take, <laughs> you don't get to do that as a professor in the classroom. So that was, no. that was um, So, you know, on that note, on the subject of recording lectures, um, someone asked if anyone used Zoom to record brief lectures around five minutes. Um, and if you have any tips or caveats. Um, you guys did the brief lectures, right? I think there were a couple of times when I felt like I needed to add something in, but I think that would be for Jordan and Amy to talk about. Well, I mean, like, it's more what we do for Women in Power, the it, kind of TAs record, like, very short, you know, 10-minute mm -hmm. uh, lectures, but I just use Zoom. I just pull up Zoom, I have my PowerPoint, I share my PowerPoint, and I record myself, and then it, it outputs it, and it's, it's the easiest way that I found. And you could edit it in iMovie, I remember... Uh, Kara, for your one um, last Women in Power over the summer, we pulled out that chunk where you were talking about veiling, mm -hmm. and I just edited it in iMovie, and it was like it was pretty easy to do and pull out chunks. And yeah, Amy usually handles it. There are ways to correct yourself, <laughs> in other words. So if you say something in a lecture and you're like, "Oh, I need to correct that," then you this is when we would find. Um, because, you know, I teach about gender and power and patriarchy, and I had a very monolithic discussion on veiling in the Middle East, and I needed to correct myself and talk about how veiling can be a means of empowerment for women going out into the workplace, and it can be a means of, of showing their Islamic faith in a Western society that rejects it here, and so those things needed to be said, and I shot a, a short we took it from a discussion section, actually, Jordan did. And then we added some PowerPoints to it, and then we posted that on the CCLE page. So it is kind of a way of adding a correction to uh, an article or something that, um, that to the editor of a newspaper. You gotta just put it into your, your um, PowerPoint and then put it in the CCLE page and the students can, can watch it. And the more provocative the correction, the better it is because then the students will actually take part in the analysis of, of the, the question you're discussing. And the other thing that I would, I do is I will also record short, like five minute videos of like, this is how you use the CCLE page. This is how you access my office hours. This is how you like all of these, like the things that I would go over the first day in class with students. Um, I make them into each their own individual small video so that students can just click on like, oh, I have a question about office hours. Here's my office hour video. So here's this quick little office hour video. And then um, same thing, like I said, uh, the syllabus, mm -hmm. um, each one of the assignments. Like I had a, a ThingLink um, tutorial, how do you sign up for ThingLink? And so they had a little tutorial of how do you sign up for Thing Things that I would go over in class with them, but that way they don't have to dig through um, because I would also, we did our sections live, I would record the sections, they don't have to dig through a 50 minute video to find that little like three to five minute thing that they actually needed. So I would also uh, do some of those. And it was just like, a lot of them would just be based on like, oh, a student emailed me a question about this. I bet everybody wants to know it. Here's my little five minute video about it. Mm -hmm. And my office hours, I ended up dispensing with my office hours in a sense because we had that weekly Thursday Zoom hour, which often went into an hour and 15, hour and a half. The students could ask me and, and I opened it up. I'm like, who's got to worry about their project? Who's freaked out about this research or that? Go ahead and type it out. You know, we don't even have to know who you are. And so I would face those research questions within that hour long Zoom. And then everyone was hearing how other students dealt with their problems. And it meant that my my office hours were essentially removed and I dealt with problem cases via email with with my TAs. So I didn't have an additional office hours beyond that that hour long meeting. And I think that was okay. But we can ask Claire and Talia, did you guys think that you needed more access to your instructors? No, I had no problems with Jordan. Like anytime I had an email or a question, like Jordan was very prompt in answering. And I really appreciated like those moments of panic when I had an, like I really needed an answer now, or like, please tell me I'm not crazy. Like, am I reading this correctly? Um, I really appreciated how accessible you guys were. Um, that was definitely like what made uh, this entire experience bearable. Um, and you guys have like emphasized like flexibility and how um, adaptive you guys are. And I think 
if I had clung to my type A ways, I would have, com I would have combusted into flame, um, like, <laughs> at the end of week two. Um, so, yeah, having that, like, reciprocal relationship where both parties are, like, mutual, where, like, I am mutually um, flexible, so very much appreciated. Um, and yeah, I think there were like many weeks where I met with Jordan when I like emailed her on a Friday night saying, hi, I don't know what I'm doing. Can we please meet Monday? And she would respond like the next morning saying, yeah, of course, um, I'll see you at this time, same time as usual. And it was very much appreciated on my end. And it's funny to see, and Claire, I'll let you jump in, but it's funny to see how anxiety works itself out in different ways, that the type A amongst us are doing, they're, they're throwing themselves into work more. And many of our other students would check out completely. And, and you had to check up on them and, and find out how they were doing. That was more difficult in, in many ways. But um, Claire, you had something to say. But yeah, I just wanted to agree with Talia. And definitely, I feel like email was extremely helpful during this period because I felt like anytime I had a problem, I didn't necessarily need to go to someone's physical office because just emailing them worked. Yeah, in some ways, things are easier, right? Mm -hmm. In some ways, the answer is, is there. You don't have to find out, are they on the second floor, third floor? There's a long line. What's going on? Um, it, there, was, there was more ease of accessibility, I, I think. And I think that with an online class, online classes are so sterile and removed. If you can try to inject some sort of humanity, flexibility, and empathy students re respond to that and work harder and do more reading and are, are more engaged rather than with additional sterility. Well, I think we have time for one more question. It's about 123. Okay, um, I'll do, the questions are quite active right now and I'm really happy to see people answering each other's questions. I think that's really helpful. Um, I'll just ask one more because there are a couple of questions about using polling features. So um, does anyone have experience with the choice feature of CCLE? Uh, specifically, can it be used to poll the students and then instantaneously display a histogram of the results? Also, would it be possible to capture the responses such that I could create a participation grade for the lecture if a student clicked two or more times in the choice feature during a lecture? So yes, so that's um, one of the questions. Someone I'll else? Oh, sorry, please go ahead. Oh, sorry, so there's another related one. Someone um, recommended a different tool, uh, UCLA's polling tool called Online Polling Tool and posted a link. Sorry. Um, and I'll let Amy and Jordan hit with that if they dealt with it in section. I am very much the, the nuanced <laughs> humanities professor that does not take one answer right or wrong or a multiple choice. I just, polling doesn't seem to work as well. Um, with the moving targets that we're dealing with in the ancient world and ideology and religion in particular. Um, so we did not use that as much. And it was more um, how to manage a discussion in a, in, a, in a complex, nuanced discussion in a Zoom capacity. So I think that's where we went. But Jordan, did you use polling at all? So I did it in my discussion section. And it was like, what do you miss most, like now that we're in quarantine, just to kind of <laughs> empathize like have a little like do you miss the library do you miss your friends um of course it was like everyone missed their friends a lot of people missed the library which I was surprised about but that was good to see um and you can it's an instant histogram and you can save it and use it as like participation for the day um so it was cool I just used it mainly just to get people talking and get people to feel more comfortable and oh, we're all human and stuff like that not actually for teaching <laughs> I think that if this class proves anything, that you can be a Luddite, i.e. me, you use no technology and no polling and no fancy stuff. I didn't do anything. I kept it very straight ahead. This is me talking. Here's my PowerPoint. We all know how to use that. And I didn't go beyond that at all. And um, I didn't try to because I didn't have the headspace for it. And um, so I, I think, you know, teach what you know and teach how you know. And if you're staying within your own sweet spot, the students will respond. Um, I'd like to just ask one more question, um, just building off that. Um, so first of all, um, I'd like to ask the undergrads, um, the students, or recent graduates actually, um, how you felt about polling tools and then moving on more uh, generally, what's something that you wish that your professors and instructors knew about remote teaching from your perspective? Um, I think for polling tools, 
personally because I'm not someone who like actively participates in class. I love going for office hours and stuff, but I'm not necessarily someone who's like always like fighting to raise my hand. So polling twos were helpful because I felt like I was being heard without necessarily. Um, I feel like with regard to the second question, I don't, I think we all just really went into this whole thing blind. So I don't think I knew a lot of things to expect as well. I just really appreciate how flexible this whole class was because there, I had other classes where it was like a 20 people class. So they're like, oh, I know it's going to be 4 a.m. for you, but like, you're just going to have to attend live. And I like, died a little, but yeah. <laughs> I definitely like the way that Jordan implemented the polling feature because I can't really think of a certain, uh, any class that I took last quarter or really like any quarter um, other than like a few STEM classes that I took where like a polling feature would have been useful for like hard and fast, hard and fast answers. Um, but like, I like, you know, like those kind of icebreaker type questions, like, did you do anything fun this weekend? Yes or no. Um, or like, what do you miss? Like that was, it was a fun use of time, but like, I don't, I can't imagine like an English class, like a professor asking like, I don't, how many books did Nabokov write? And we have answers because it, it just seems like a, it, it seems like pedantic and like not very engaging for me to click a button um, and pretend that I know information about someone. Um, and it, like in terms of remote learning, I think all of my professors um, uh, approach the different tools for remote learning um, in different ways. Um, I learned a lot about like what CCLE could do. Um, I didn't really, I didn't, I didn't know anything about CCLE beyond like discussion board feature, like writing and uh, responding to people, but like um, seeing my French professor, for example, like learn how to um, administer quizzes and do kind of like quick grammar checks um, on CCLE was interesting. Um, I think just what Professor Cooney said, like, don't try to incorporate too many bells and whistles into your lectures. Um, if you've never used bells and whistles before, like stick to the content. Um, so like, just because um, you can break students off into like little groups, like doesn't mean you should, because sometimes it's more effective to have things together. Um, and again, like just focusing on, again, like doing what you know and doing what you know well um, is really like the best way to approach things. Great. Um, I think that's all the time that we have. We have about one minute. And um, quickly, I'd like to say <laughs> thanks to David and to Kara for helping kind of moderate as I was having issues with my Wi-Fi, which is, you know, normal life. And that's how, that's how it happens. Thank you so much for doing that. And a really big thanks to Jordan, to David, to Claire, to David McFadden, Alejandra, Kara, Amy, Talia, and in the background, Tegan, as well as Anne. Uh, thank you all for joining us and thank you all attendees for coming today. Um, at two o'clock, one last plug, um, the humanities welcome, the virtual humanities welcome is happening. And I have, um, dropped the link uh, for information on that on the chat. So if you are able to make uh, to make it, uh, please feel free to do so. David is uh, going to be there um, and as well as uh, some some guests, um, uh, alum as well uh, from, from the humanity. So please, um, if you can make it, please attend. Once again, thank you all for coming and um, have an amazing fall quarter and hopefully we will all see each other again in person sooner rather than later. Thank, thank you. you. Thank